Welcome everyone to a new series for this channel. If you've been here a while, you'll know I'm a huge Python fan. But today, we'll start a journey together into the world of Rust. Why Rust? Well, my eventual goal is to be able to use Rust to write powerful Python extensions, building on Rust's speed, safety, and reliability. So join me and we'll dive into this new language together. The resource we're going to be using to learn Rust is actually linked on what's known as the book. If you look in the bottom part of this page here, you'll see a notice for an alternate version of the book. And this is also the version that was recommended by one of my coworkers who uses Rust every day. So we'll click through and see what it has. And in this page, it's going to describe the things that Brown has changed compared to the normal book. Some things I'm excited about are the interactive quizzes that they're going to add for each section as well as some of the changes that will be making to explanations to hopefully make them a bit more clear. And in this last section, they're going to ask us to collect some basic data to participate in the experiment and improve it, which I'll happily agree to. Now, this next section is going to give us an introduction to some of the elements that have changed as part of this, including quizzes. So when we see sections like this, we can click to start the quiz. Now, they want us to choose the wrong answer first for some reason which of course we got wrong, but it does look like it gives us an opportunity to retry the quiz, which we'll do now, selecting the correct answer and submitting, and here we see it's correct. Now down to the highlighting section. This looks pretty interesting. It looks like it gives us an ability to, within the page itself, to highlight a section, and then we can click this button to add any kind of notes that we want. So we'll submit that, and if we hover over, we see we have some highlight text. The next section talks about the changes that have been made throughout the course, the most recent being from February 16th, 2023, and that looks to add a new chapter in here. And then finally, we end up with an acknowledgement of the people and organizations that have made this experiment possible. So the way this series is probably going to work is I'm not going to read through everything that we have in all of these pages. I'm going to go through, read things myself, and when I find something interesting or something to demo, then I'll bring you back in and we'll talk about it. So I'll go ahead and do that now. And the first important section for us is the installation section. And in here, it wants us to install the Rust Up utility. The way we're going to do that, at least for myself, since I'm on Linux, is I'm going to be executing this bash script. Now I do not recommend that you do this for every site that gives you this option, but since I trust them and read through the source, I'm gonna do it. Now, I don't need to modify anything, and it is nice that they give us this rust up self uninstall utility if we want, so I'll just hit one and enter. And now we're installed, and we see rust is installed, great. Now, as you can tell by my tab completion, even though it's installed, we don't have it active in this shell environment. So what we'll need to do, since it's already been added to our path, is just to restart our current shell or refresh it, which is an alias that I have available. Once we do that, we should see yep, a few more options available for Rust in here. Now, for Windows and Mac users, your installation is going to be a bit different than mine, but the options are all there in the installer section. Now, one cool thing that I see here is that it has a built-in update mechanism available called RustUp Update, or specifically an update command for the RustUp utility. So let's try that, and we see that nothing needs to be updated, so it's been unchanged. And then finally, RustUp also has a subcommand for doc generation. So if you're on RustUp and then doc, it'll open up a new page in our browser with a bunch of links and some information about Rust in general that we could launch from here. So now let's start this quiz. And the question is, what is the name of the command line tool for managing the version of Rust on your machine? Which we just installed, and the answer to that should be RustUp. So let's click Submit. And there we go. All right, 
let's move on to our next section which looks to be setting up our hello world example awesome now the first thing it wants us to do is to create a new projects directory well I've already got this learn rust directory so I'm not gonna create a new one instead I'm just gonna go straight to making a new hello world directory and moving into that with this giant text things are getting a little bit crowded so if you don't mind what I'll do is decrease the font size a decent amount and if that's something you can't read anymore then please let me know down in the comments we'll clear that to give ourselves a bit more space and now it wants us to make our main.rs file so our first rust file Now we're going to say fn main, what I believe is a function definition for main. We do two curly braces. Then we're going to type print line or print ln with an exclamation point and then the string hello world on the inside with a semicolon at the end. Okay, it doesn't really give us any explanation for the code at this point, which I'm assuming is going to happen later. So it just tells us to save the file and go back to our terminal. So that's exactly what we'll do. Now it's telling us to run rustc main.rs to compile our program. And if we look at our current directory, we see, yep, we have a new main file. So that should be our compiled Rust program which we can then execute to see hello world. Awesome. So we just compiled and ran our first Rust program. Okay, now it breaks down into the anatomy section. So let's open that file back up and take a look at what we have here. So first up is that fn, which is a function definition. Just like what we did with Python, instead of having def, we'd use fn. And then the name of the function is main. Main appears to be required by Rust as the entry point for our programs, which takes no arguments here. Of course, those curly braces again. Then we have a print line macro. Looks like the exclamation point is used to denote a macro. They don't really tell us the difference between a macro and a regular function right now, but I'm going to assume that it does a little bit more than just print out hello world, or at least accept just a normal string. And another thing I'm seeing over here that I'm excited about is when they're talking about this Rust format tool, which is a built-in that they provide to format Rust code in a standardized way. Now, in the Python world, we have a number of different options available for this. Personally, I like tools like black, but this looks like a great option for Rust. So I'll collapse this text in a bit more, bring in the single line, and let's see what Rust format does to it. Of course, we should test to see if it still compiles, which it does, and that it still runs, which it does. So it's still valid Rust, but when we run Rust format and pass in main.rs, we should get with the ideal formatted code, which looks exactly like what we were told to do. Pretty nice. Now the only thing left to do is to go down and take the quiz for this section. And the first question is every executable Rust program must contain a function with the name. And this answer should be main. Okay, hit submit. Question two, let's say you have the following program in a file hello.rs. So exactly what we just had before. Say you run the command rustc hello.rs from the command line. Which statement best describes what happens next? And our options are one, rustc generates a binary executable named hello. Two, rustc executes the program and prints out hello world. Three, rustc preformats hello.rs according to the rust style guide. Or four, Rust C will print an error because this is an invalid program. Now, looking at the code, looks the same as what we did, so pretty sure it's not invalid. So the option that I'm going to choose is 1, and we'll see what happens. Hit submit, and it looks like we got both right. Let's move on to the next section.
Now this next section here is another big reason why I chose Rust is because it has the cargo build system, which is vastly superior to anything that we have in Python, if we're being honest with ourselves. Uh, I don't think it's much of a secret that packaging in Python is a bit of a mess. Although some things have happened recently when it comes to standardization, it's nothing like they have in Rust with Cargo, which handles building dependencies and everything within the project itself. And it's a single standard that everyone can get behind, which is pretty nice. Now what they're telling us is that since we used Rust up to install Rust, we should have Cargo installed. So we check that with cargo dash death version, and we see that I'm currently on 1.73. Next, it wants us to get out of the directory that we're currently in. So I'll move up one directory and make a new project using Cargo, saying Cargo new, and then hello underscore Cargo, which should create a new directory, which we see here. So we'll move into that. And we should also see that it added some supporting files as well, like our .git directory, as well as our .git ignore file. And we see here that it is activated a master branch. We see that it added a source directory. And interestingly enough, Cargo puts the metadata that we need into a cargo.toml file. So let's take a look at that now. Awesome. And here we see two main sections, which is package and dependencies. And for our name, we see hello underscore cargo, just like we defined at the command line. Version, they gave us 0.1. It's interesting that they forced 0.1 on you. So they must have some stricter rules around semantic versioning which I'll we'll probably describe later. I'm also unsure what editions are. So let's click on this appendix. It gives us edition 2021, which reading through this, it looks like this is the version that Cargo should use when building Rust. See, we have versions from 2015, 2018, 2021, which is about a three year release cycle, meaning that we should expect if it keeps us up, the next version or the next edition of Rust that's going to be used here to be 2024. And then if we don't specify a version, it's going to default to the earliest version available for compatibility sake, which would be 2015. So we'll leave this file alone and we'll keep edition equal to 2021. And finally, for this file, we have the dependencies section, which right now our program's too simple. So we're not going to touch anything when it comes to dependencies. Okay, we'll clear the terminal to clean things up a little bit. And they're telling us that we have a main.rs file that's been generated under the source directory, which is kind of interesting. So let's take a look at that. And it gives us a hello world example. I guess this is their way of encouraging a particular project structure, ensuring that you have a main function available, probably in a main.rs file. And they don't want us to do anything with this for this example. So we'll just leave it as is and move on to building. Next thing it wants us to do is to use cargo build to build our current project. We don't have to pass anything in. And it looks like the build completed in 0.21 seconds. So that's pretty good. And it should have created a debug version of our project underneath a target directory. And here we see our new target directory. And if we look in there under debug, we see a few different things, but most importantly is our hello cargo executable, which we'll execute now. And there we go. We see hello world printed out. Perfect. It looks like you can use cargo run to also run your program and it will build it if it needs to. Since it already built a previous version, didn't detect any changes, it didn't have to recompile. So let's go ahead and try changing the file now from hello world to hello, save rust, save that, and then try cargo run again. Yeah, it, recompiled it and ran it again. So if nothing needs to change, it won't change it or it won't recompile it. But if something does change, then it will recompile when it runs it. 
pretty nice. Now the last part of cargo it wants us to try out is cargo check, which they say when we run this, we'll just check the validity of our program. Yep, we don't see that it needed to recompile anything. It didn't run our program. So it just basically checks the syntax and makes sure that we're not gonna run into any issues before we try to compile it. I can see this being pretty useful in something like pre-commit checks locally. Actually, there's one more thing for us to do within Cargo, which is release builds. So when we built before, everything was built under our debug directory. But with the release version, it looks like it's gonna give us a more polished version of our executable. So we'll run Cargo build dash dash release, which should now create a new compiled version under our target directory, which here we see release. And in there we see a few different things as well as our hello cargo executable. So let's go ahead and run that now. And just as expected, we see hello rust. Now with all these build artifacts, I'd expect cargo to also put in a entry for our git ignore. So let's see, and yeah. So we ignore everything under the target directory so you don't have to worry about anything in there being version controlled. Smart. Now the only thing left to do in this chapter is for us to take the quiz. And it looks like there's just one question, which is, so you just downloaded a cargo project and then you run cargo run at the command line. Which statement is not true about what happens next? The first option is that cargo executes the project's binary. The second is cargo downloads and builds any dependencies of the project. The third is that cargo watches for the file changes and executes the binary on a change. The fourth option is cargo builds the project into a binary in the target slash debug directory. Okay, so the first one should be true because we're running cargo run. So it should both build a debug binary as well as execute the binary, which means one and four, definitely true. For any dependencies, I'd assume that if the project has dependencies, this would definitely be true. So I think one, two, and four are all correct, which leaves three, it watching for changes and executing the binary on a change to be incorrect because this is the first time that we're running Cargo Run. So for this, I'm gonna select option three and we'll see if that's correct. And it looks like it is. Awesome. And that brings us to the end of this chapter and the end of this video. If you're learning along with me, let me know how you did. Or if you found anything particularly challenging or ran into any issues down in the comments and maybe we can help each other through it. If you're already familiar with Rust, then please don't spoil anything major. But if you have any tips for anything we covered in this video, those would be greatly appreciated as well. Also, if you want to keep up with this series as we go along, because there's plenty more chapters to go through, please consider subscribing. But as always, thank you for watching.